Are we as a society leaving money on the table by employing women as only 5% of Fortune 500 CEOs? Contemplate Chicago professor Miriam Bertrand, who measures gender and racial inequality in the labor market. Get the latest social impact research and news from Chicago Booth's Rustandi Center for Social Sector Innovation. Subscribe to the free Rustandi Monthly at chicagobooth.edu slash newsletter. When you think about genetics, what comes to mind? Science fiction? They extract the preserved blood from the mosquito and bingo. Dino DNA. CRISPR gene editing. If there's something that you want to fix on a strand of DNA uh, with CRISPR, you could theoretically find it, cut it out, and paste in a fix. Or maybe at-home DNA kits. The company 23andMe promises genetic information made easy. The last decade has been called a genetic renaissance, and as science gets better and better at identifying the power of our genes, people want to know how much do our genes determine our future. Your DNA sequence might be fixed, but the power of your genome for your life is not fixed. It's not inexorable. That's Catherine Page Harden, a professor of psychology at the University of Texas at Austin, who focuses on behavioral genetics and is the author of a new book, The Genetic Lottery, Why DNA Matters for Social Equality. There's this double consciousness around genetics mattering. It's knowledge that's seen both as obvious by many people, but also as deeply controversial and surprising by other people. And those two narratives are existing at the same time. Nature, nurture, it's an old debate. But Hardin says it's becoming increasingly clear that nurture plays a role in working with our genes. But those genes determine more about us than we'd all like to think. And not just on your height or your eye color, but also people who are born with a certain set of DNA variants are more likely to go further in school. And obviously because of the ways that education is rewarded to make more money, to be wealthier, um, and to be healthier throughout their lives. Hardin's work takes us to some deeply uncomfortable places, but she says we need to confront it head on and use it to build a more equitable and just society. What I'm asking people to do then is actually a really difficult thing, which is to say, okay, yes, I have that reaction. What does that tell me about the extent that I've internalized this idea of intelligence as worth? And if we really thought of intelligence as as morally arbitrary as height, where does that take us in terms of our kind of vision of justice and vision of equality? From the University of Chicago Podcast Network, this is Big Brains, a podcast about the pioneering research and pivotal breakthroughs that are reshaping our world. On this episode, the unexpected role that genetics could play in building social justice. I'm your host, Paul Rand. In October 1990, scientists around the globe began the Human Genome Project. Thirteen years later, the results gave us an unprecedented look at what lies within us on the most fundamental level. And with the fruition of the Human Genome Project in 2003, what we were doing was identifying that the Book of Life could be read in the A's and C's and T's and G's of genetic code. Since then, scientists have been trying to identify specific sentences in that book, figuring out which genes are associated with which traits. And recently, they've begun looking beyond just our physical traits to see if genes also have a hand in determining how successful we may be in our society. Almost everything that we are interested in studying in humans is not influenced by one gene. There's not an intelligence gene. There's not a gay gene. There's not a depression gene. There's not even a tall gene. All of these things are what people often refer to as complex traits, which means that they are influenced by many, 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 many genes, each of which have a tiny association and that often work in ways that most of the time, the vast majority of the time, we don't even know why they're associated. So these are things that are polygenic. Polygenic sounds like a big word, but it just means many genes, like a mosaic scattered throughout your genetic code that together creates the traits that make you who you are. Individually, the different pieces of my mosaic and your mosaic are called SNPs. Single nucleotide polymorphisms. Polymorphisms just means many versions, right? And single nucleotide means single DNA letter. So these are 
differences between people in single DNA letters. All of our genome is made up of four DNA letters, G, C, T, and A. And so we differ in particular spots in terms of these letters. So I might have a T in one spot, whereas you have a G in that spot. And that's a variant um, or a polymorphism. It's a way that people differ genetically. In order to pinpoint how all these SNPs shape our lives, Harden and her colleagues use something called Genome-Wide Association Studies, or GWAS for short. So a huge sample of people, usually who are homogenous, very similar with regards to their self-identified ethnic ancestry and with regards to their genetic ancestry. So the patterns of similarity that we can see between people that exist because they have, they share recent genetic ancestors. So again, it's this backdrop of genetic similarity that people have by virtue of having, you know, shared recent ancestors. We look at differences between them in their SNPs that we've measured and correlate them with something that has been measured about their outcome. Basically, if many mosaics look the same in certain places and those people have similar outcomes, we can conclude that those patterns are correlated with a certain trait. So this could be their height, which SNPs are more common for taller people versus shorter people. This could be their um physical disease. But the specific traits that Harden is looking for are more controversial. And in our cases, we're looking at the sorts of outcomes that economists, sociologists, and psychologists usually study, which are things like educational attainment, ADHD in childhood, at what age did you first have a child? By educational attainment, I mean how far you go in school. Income, so what's your household income or personal income per year? So it's simply asking which genetic variants are correlated with whatever we're measuring as an outcome. And then those correlations can then be taken and applied in a new study of a new group of people. So I've done a large GWAS of these SNPs are correlated with um, having more ADHD symptoms in childhood. Now I'm gonna measure the DNA of a new group of children and I'm gonna measure their SNPs and I'm going to use the correlations that I've estimated in my GWAS to add up information about their genome into a single number, and we call that number a polygenic score or polygenic index. Harden says they can use polygenic scores to predict all sorts of things, but out of all the traits that Harden looks for, educational success is at the forefront because... Education plays such an outsized role in structuring inequality in America right now. So if we, you know, we can think about kind of three ways that people's lives turn out differently by the end of their life. And one is around physical health, like how healthy are you? Do you have diabetes? One is around mental health and psychological well-being. And then one is around economic outcomes. How wealthy are you? How much money do you make? All three of those things are increasingly structured by participation in higher education. So more educated Americans, they don't just make more money. They also show lower rates of psychiatric disease, more psychological well-being, and live longer, physical, more physically healthy lives. So if you, if, you know, if you want to think about like, what is the fault line for inequality in America? One of those is education. And I think it just makes it a really important thing to study. Okay, you're saying those were some pretty fancy words. Show me the evidence. Well, one place geneticists look for evidence is by studying twins. You know, if we look at identical twins who are, you know, very, very similar, as close to similar as we get in humans in their genome, but also are starting their life in the same social position in terms of being born to the same parents in the same historical moment in the same neighborhood. If we look at how much identical twins differ, that gives us some sort of window into how often do people's lives turn out differently when they have the same starting point? In practice, as we've currently constructed our educational system in high-income countries in Northern Europe, America, Australia, which is where twin research is conducted, how often do they end up different? And they do end up different in their divorce and they do end up different in their income, but they don't end up that different in their cognitive ability and education. So identical twins end up about as similar for their education as they end up for their height. And that's not all genetics. A big part of that is their social environment. Um, but in terms of their differences, they're much more minimal than I think people have kind of realized and internalized when they think about how much latitude people have around their education relative to their starting point in a life. Harden has also been working on GWASs that have identified genetic correlations with educational attainment. 
One study actually showed that genes could capture 10 to 15% of educational success. And that may not sound like a lot at first, until you realize that wealth inequality accounts for only 11%. Basically, she says, your genes play as much a role in your educational success as your parents' wealth. Harden has done another GWAS that showed individuals with a high polygenic score for externalizing, which is a tendency to violate rules and social norms, were three times more likely to be incarcerated. And if all of this is starting to make you feel a bit uneasy, well, you're not alone. I think that the idea of genes mattering, of them making a difference, and and particularly making a difference for social and behavioral life outcomes that are valued and rewarded in society is, of course, associated with controversy in people's minds because of the history of the eugenics movement, particularly in the earlier part of the 20th century. Many people have worries about race dynamics here. And one of the most concerning factors in this kind of genetics research is that it's only been focused on people with white European ancestry. Oh, I think it's very concerning. I think in terms of our responsibility as a scientific community to be inclusive and also the sort of the the limitation scientifically when you're focusing on on only this kind of really narrow slice of global genetic diversity. Because of genetic variations, the discoveries of a GWAS of all white people just aren't transferable to others. For instance, a particular gene mutation that causes cystic fibrosis in 70% of European populations only causes it in 30% of cases in African populations. You can't neatly correlate a green mosaic with a purple one with an orange one. We just are shooting ourselves in the foot in terms of discovering genes that are associated with human variation. I mean, if we think about, particularly when we're thinking about African populations, you know, they are more genetically diverse than the rest of the globe. Even things that we think of as very genetically simple, such as skin pigmentation, Zara Tishkoff has done really beautiful work with her colleagues showing how much we don't know because we've only studied variants that exist in Northern Europeans. And there's whole sets of genetic diversity that like that are invisible to us when we're not studying people um, from around the globe. It's also worth mentioning that as far as people will benefit from learning about how their genes shape their lives, if these studies are only done on one group and those findings can't translate to another, only white Europeans will reap the benefits. So I think there's there's so much opportunity for scientific knowledge to be had from being more inclusive in our science. But there's also an understandable fear that if we start looking for genetically determined differences within a particular group of people like a GWAS, then some people might look for them between whites and blacks, for example. And inaccurate science could give fuel to white supremacists. Because especially in the American context, as soon as you start talking about genes and education, people immediately start thinking about race, even though the genetic research is not informative about racial differences at all. And race is not a genetic construct. I guess I'm a little confused by this. And, yeah, and so, a lot of people and, are. It's really confusing. Yeah, <laughs> yeah so, so, so I guess is, is the answer, especially knowing who the studies have been done on that some of these basic traits that we're talking about, even schooling and, and how well you'll do in school, is not going to differ based on your, your race because the genetic codes are similar enough in people anywhere in the world, or is that not what you're saying? Yeah, that's not quite right. So it could, so it's not, it, they might differ by ancestry in the sense that some ancestry groups have different patterns of genetic variation. So if something varies in a spot that doesn't vary for like another group in that spot, and ancestry is correlated with race. And then also our genes are influencing our bodies and brains, but then society is responding to those in racialized ways. So we see, for instance, that like an educational attainment polygenic score, SNPs associated with going further in school that's developed in, in big GWASs of European ancestry people. If you use that same polygenic score, but calculate it in a group of African-American school children in the US, mm-hmm. it's not related to how far they go in school. Right. And why is that? No one really knows the answer. Is it because the genes involved with the traits that are selected for in schooling are different in African ancestry populations? Or is it that 
you know, for instance, children who are bright and inquisitive and white are rewarded, but maybe they're, you know, stigmatized as oppositional if they're children of color and that actually hurts their chances of schooling. And there are these kind of like racialized biases that are responding to the same genetically influenced traits in different ways. So those are really big kind of scientific unknowns right now that people are are pointing out. So if this is so concerning, why are there more studies done on non-white, non-Europeans? It's simply because that is where the data is and that's where the money is. So the biggest sources of data for GWAS come from biobanks, such as UK Biobank, which is predominantly white British, European genetic ancestry, um, customers of direct-to-consumer genomics companies like 23andMe, and then data from countries that keep very detailed records, such as Iceland or Finland. But it isn't just racial dynamics that causes people discomfort with this work. It's that it stabs at the very heart of our system of meritocracy. And if some portion of your success is just the lucky genetic hand you were dealt, what does that say about ownership and fairness in society? When I think about the role that luck has played in people's lives in shaping their quote unquote economic success, it's even harder for me to find the kind of arguments that, you know, people don't deserve certain things because they didn't succeed uh, in school, they didn't succeed in the labor market. I find them even more troubling and insufficient. And as we said, genes can account for 10 to 15 percent, and it could be even more of your educational success, just as much, if not more, than your parents' wealth. But what about that other 80 percent? We've given nature its due, but what about nurture? So, you know, um, ages ago, when I was still a grad student, I was able to teach my last year of my PhD a seminar for upper level UVA undergrads. So it was, they're mostly seniors. Upper level meaning they have higher genes for intelligence. Is that what you're trying to say? <laughs> they, so they, the title of the class was called The Nature and Nurture Debate, but their essay for their final was explain why your instructor hates the phrase, the nature nurture debate. Okay, so not nature versus nurture. That's really kind of a false distinction because we know that for each, every individual person, genes and environments are always working in combination with one another, one another over development. Like if you went to a restaurant and someone at the end of the, you know, of your meal was like, which was more important to you, having a chair to sit in or having salt in your food? <laughs> like that would be a nonsensical question. Like you obviously need both of those things in order to enjoy your meal. And it's the same thing about development. Like we always need, we're always talking about an, an interaction and a transaction when we're talking about the development of people. So I'm less interested in saying nature versus nurture and more interested in how can understanding nature in terms of these, these new tools we've gotten, that like we can measure the human genome. I mean, these are amazing technologies. How can they help us understand nurture? To what extent is nurture an important process of nature having its effect? So people have genetic differences, but they provoke different things from their social environments. Um, and in fact, I think one of the biggest um, possibilities for science in the coming decades, what I'm really excited about thinking about is how we can use genetics to identify opportunities for environmental change. The dangers and possibilities of those environmental changes after the break. If you're getting a lot out of the important research that's shared on Big Brains, there's another University of Chicago Podcasts Network show that you should check out. It's called Capital Isn't. Capital Isn't uses the latest economic thinking to zero in on the ways that capitalism is, and more often isn't, working today. From the debate over how to distribute a vaccine to the morality of a wealth tax, capitalism clearly explains how capitalism can go wrong and what we can do about it. Listen to Capitalism, part of the University of Chicago Podcast Network. Perhaps you've seen the 1997 sci-fi film Gattaca. It tells the story of a dystopian society in which people have been divided into a genetic caste system. We now have discrimination down to a science. <laughs> For all my brave talk, I knew it was just that. No matter how much I trained or how much I studied, the best test score in the world wasn't going to matter unless I had the blood test to go with it. While we don't seem to be anywhere near a point in which we can predict a person's future based on their genes, 
But of course, people are fearful that that's where the work of scientists like Hardin is going. And if it does, what's to stop that from happening? And there's privacy concerns too. Suppose we're able to identify a polygenic score for the increased likelihood of you becoming an alcoholic. Can you imagine if that information was sent to your possible future employer or significant other? I do think that there is a space here for we already regulate what sorts of information can be used in certain contexts, employment contexts or credit contexts or insurance contexts, like right. to what, where do we need to say like polygenic score information or genetic information needs to be regulated in similar ways. I also want to point out that, you know, people are very attuned to the ways in which like talking about genetics could be used in harmful ways. But, but so, so this gets into, it was, it was interesting. I was on a drive yesterday uh, and listening to an interview with Kara Swisher and the founder of 23andMe and all of the uh, components and worries about privacy and genetic markers. And she was arguing if you could understand your DNA and you could actually help make sure that you, you know, your child was not going to get breast cancer, wouldn't you do it? Now, um, if I now take that same argument to this and say, well, if I actually could produce, because now I understand the links between DNA to intelligence, and I could make my child more intelligent, why, why wouldn't I do it? And is that different back to this? Well, it's really different in one way, which is it's really different scientifically. So when we're talking about BRCA, we're talking about What's BRCA? A sing- the, the breast cancer uh, mutation. Okay. Um, you know, we're talking about a, a single gene with a large effect that we're not seeing this massive polygenicity, this, you know, many, many genes affecting something. What you get with polygenicity is also the same genes are associated with lots of different traits, right? So, you know, in our work, we've looked at genetic variants associated with going further in school that are not associated with intelligence test score performance, what economists often call non-cognitive skills. And what we see there is that you know, some of the same genetic variants are associated with going further in school, but also having a higher risk for schizophrenia. So whenever we're moving away from single genes of large effects to many genes Mm. with small effects, but multiple effects with pleiotropic effects, you right, this kind of multivariate space. Back to there is no intelligence gene. There's no intelligence gene, right? So we're talking about trying to, you know, what a parent increase their child's probability of having a higher IQ test score. If the expected gain from that selection, when you're selecting within embryos created by a family, is very marginal and comes with, you know, off-target selection effects where you're also marginally increasing their risk of schizophrenia and bipolar disorder and autism. But that doesn't mean that Hardin wants to completely disentangle genetics from social policy and politics. In fact, she wants to tangle them up even more. So I didn't think it would be enough to just say, this is what the genetics are saying. You know, just a logical appeal. I think given the history of how this work has been used and construed and talked about, I thought it was important to to also have an ethical appeal in there, to say, this is how I think this work uh, fits in with the concerns that many people do have about equality and inequality. Hardin believes that we can learn from genetics research to make more equitable societies by taking genetic differences into account when designing the politics and the systems that define our world. As she says in her book, there's a famous quip from economist Art Goldberger. Your genetics cause your poor eyesight, but your eyeglasses still work just fine. It felt like I couldn't describe the science and just walk away from the conversation. I needed, if I was going to describe the science, it also felt incumbent on me to to do to the best of that I could describe, well, how do I see this fitting into the larger egalitarian project? Um, And that's obviously a riskier thing to do as a scientist. I mean, like it puts my own self into the book in a way that many, many, you know, academic press, science, nonfiction books wouldn't do. But I think it's a a way of broadening the conversation about what is this for? All right. Give me an example. Let's let's get practical with this. What policies and laws specifically do you say this insight tells us that we have to do this differently? Yeah. So I would say right now it's what I would want them to do is evaluate the research on which the policy is based 
differently. Okay. This is a very, the, the people, it's funny, I'm giving you a very unsexy example, because I think when people think about genetics, they immediately want to go to, okay, well, how are policymakers going to like measure something about people's genes and like do something differently? And actually, I think we're not even there. I think we're at a spice in which most of the things that policymakers try, particularly in the realm of education and child development, most of our interventions that people say, and now we're going to, you know, teach parents to talk more to their kids, or we're going to try this new fangled thing in our schools. Most of that makes absolutely no difference for children's cognitive development or emotional development. And there's lots of reasons for that. But one reason is that the research on which those policy proposals is often based is based on correlating things about kids with their parents and then saying, oh, now we're going to change this aspect of their parents and like it's going to make their lives better. And all of that research has this like flaw in it, which is that it ignores genetic differences between people. So if policymakers just walked away from my book being like, the science is cool um, and when someone comes to me with this kind of like hot new idea that like what we should do is change X about parents to improve kids' lives, they just looked at it with an eye of, did the science take into account that parents also pass on their genes to their kids? Like just as a filter, like as a, like a credibility check, I actually think that that would be like my, my big push for policymakers right now, which I is so, I, yeah, which is so unsexy compared yes, to like is, personalizing also, education. Yes. It's very unsatisfying. So I'm going to see if I can, I, I'm going to try to push okay, for, go for something it. that to me might be a little more okay. satisfying. If, there's an insight that you want to be taken and say, listen, when you are considering developing policy, if you understood this about genetics and how it impacted mm -hmm. how people took their lives, you would structure these policies different. So either um, there are reasons that uh, it goes beyond people's control over what they're capable of doing, um, or if parents have this issue and it's and it's led by this, it's very likely that's going to pass on to their kids. So you have to account for this. It doesn't matter what kind of program you should put in place. Work that out for me a little bit more clearly. So right now we, we have this, these studies of this kind of genetic lottery of within family variation. And then over here, social scientists are doing work on policy valuation, RCTs of interventions, Let's combine those. Let's think about the ways that the genetics can be leveraged to figure out things about the mechanisms of the environmental shock and the environmental shocks can be leveraged to figure out the mechanisms of these genetic influences. I'm not a policy scholar. I want policy scholars to be thinking about genetics and like where they can run with it. And it's, you know, when it's, I want it to be seen as a, as a limited but useful methodological tool that can then be um, integrate it and like the work, like the frameworks of social scientists do, doing their work rather than always treated with these kind of kid gloves of like, oh, but aren't, are we unlocking some sort of eugenic Pandora's box? That would ultimately be my, my goal. I'm here to make genetics boring for social scientists <laughs> <laughs> as part of their regular work day. All right. What did I not ask you about Paige that, uh, you think based on some of the things we've talked about would would help round out the story. Anything? Um, I'm really, this is, that's a really good question. You know, one thing we didn't talk about is just how personal this feels to so many people. You know, there's the kind of the academic conversation about it, which is, you know, how can we use this in policy evaluation or what regulation do we need? Or like, how can we use this in our, you know, as an adjunct to instrumental variables designs? And um, and then there's a kind of like the historical political conversation about it. What I've been really surprised by is the number of emails that I've gotten in the last three weeks where people just want to tell me their story about their kids or their adoption or their siblings or their class of students that they teach or how they found their biological parent as an adult, these stories of difference and connection and always feeling weird and not really having any narrative around it and then wondering how genetics played a role in their own story. And um, so to your listeners, if you read the book and you have a story like that, please write me because I love hearing them and I love hearing about how um, how people think of genetics through this lens of a personal narrative. <laughs>
If you're getting a lot out of the important research shared on Big Brains, there's another University of Chicago Podcast Network show you should check out. It's called Not Another Politics Podcast. Not Another Politics Podcast provides a fresh perspective on the biggest political stories, not through opinions and anecdotes, but through rigorous scholarship, massive data sets, and a deep knowledge of theory. If you want to understand the political science behind the political headlines, then listen to Not Another Politics Podcast, part of the University of Chicago Podcast Network. Big Brains is a production of the UChicago Podcast Network. If you like what you heard, please give us a review and a rating. The show is hosted by Paul M. Rand and produced by me, Matt Hodap, with assistance from Alyssa Eads. Thanks for listening. Thank you.